So what I wanted to talk to you about today, as uh, Anna has said, is science communication in Poland. Um, and to be honest, um, I was very happy when they told me that maybe I'll have a chance to talk about it. Because uh, if you ask me about 10 years ago, um, if there is science communication in Poland, I would look at you like, well, first of all, what is science communication? <laughs> Secondly, uh, you mean like the old professors at universities that you can go and like they do these boring lectures? Is that science communication? <laughs> oh, well, I suppose you communicate science, so it's science communication. Oh, and I know in Warsaw there's like this picnic, there's like one tent they put in the middle of a park and you can go there and they do some experiments. It's kind of for kids, but yeah, they do it. Then if you ask me about eight years ago or seven years ago, I'd be like, yeah, and you know that this picnic, it's actually pretty big now. They have 20 tents <laughs> and they're still in this park, um, but they're pretty good in what they're doing. And there's like some, um, some experiments for adults as well. And, and the talks at universities, the, the boring professor stuff, actually this started getting kind of interesting. So there is this newspaper in Warsaw that publishes, this day we're opening labs in universities all around Warsaw and you can choose which one you want to go to and they will try to do something interesting. And then you go, half of it is boring, half of it is interesting. Uh, but people started noticing, oh, there's, there is this interest. Like whenever the newspaper says, today we're opening labs across the town, people go bonkers. I was in high school and for example, when some of the first ideas for that started, it was still kind of boring during a couple of lectures around Warsaw, but I was like skipping lessons. I was the kind of guy that like would never skip lessons. But when there was a science festival happening in Warsaw and I could go to labs, haha, <laughs> I was not at school definitely that day. And most of my friends would go as well. So the point where my school actually decided, okay, on that day we'll give you a free day because like everybody's off classes and we don't want you guys skipping classes too much. Um, so, and this started growing very slowly, there was no money for that. We, I remember sitting in a debate in a room like this one, where people would be like, science communication, is this ever going to happen in Poland? And one person sitting in one chair said like, well, if the government supported it, <laughs> then maybe. And the second person said, in 10 or 20 years, maybe. And the third person said, not in 100 years <laughs> will that happen. <laughs> or if there was like a um, um, very uh, good philanthropist in Poland, maybe they would support it. Um, so, and that didn't seem to be happening. We didn't have too many uh, philanthropists that are wealthy enough in Poland. So then, this is a couple of years ago. Um, about 10 years ago, I would say most of what I'm describing has been happening. And it's really weird for me now to stand in front of you. Um, what you can see behind me is the logo of the Copernicus Science Center, um, the biggest science center in Europe with a million visitors um, that we opened only eight years ago. Um, what you can see in here is a part of our exhibition that's outside that you can always see. And, uh, and it's the, the science center I will talk to you about is now just a tiny part of all the science communication happening in Poland. And so I wanted to, uh, this will be a weird session because I, I don't want to just give you a talk. Uh, there's so much going on that I figured I can't cover everything in about one hour. So what I'd like to do is basically give you um, information about some of the things that we do. I have a presentation prepared to talk about almost all of it, but I don't think we'll have time to cover all of it. So what I'll be doing is, if at any moment during my presentation you have any questions, or you want to, for me to do like a deeper dive into any of the things that you see on screen or hear me talk about, please interrupt me and you know, raise your hand and I will try to cover what you're interested in slightly more. Um, typically, what I would like you to ask is not a very specific question, uh, for example, can you describe a situation of, for example, I don't know, uh, people 10 to 12 in Poland being interested in physics, uh, but please um, ask me about any of the things you see on screen and ask me that I would like to maybe go slightly deeper into it. Um, so I'll try to do it. If we're getting too many questions, at some point I'll stop you because I want to cover some more ground. Um, but I would love you guys to be able to say that there is something that caught your interest, maybe you can do it in Ukraine as well, maybe you're already doing it, maybe you want to do it differently and ask about it. Um, obviously I'll, I'm staying until the end of the day today and I'll be happy to, to talk to you till kingdom, kingdom come. So the main broad areas that I selected for today's talk is some of the things that we do in science communication, which is obviously science centers. Um, the second area, we have some large scale uh, events that popularize science. There is uh, science media that we currently have in Poland, uh, both traditional and online. We have NGOs and I'll, I'll talk 
talk more about those. And we have businesses that do science communication um, for money. And now, one last very important thing to say is, all these things are not completely separate. When I talk about businesses and science centers, there are science centers that are businesses. There are NGOs that are businesses as well. There are science media that are businesses. There are science media that are done by science centers, etc., etc. Many of these things have overlaps. They're not completely separate. So, to start with, science centers. That's the map from this year of science centers in Poland. If, again, I showed you a map from 10 years ago, um, there was one here. So that's what we built over the last 10 years. And uh, we are building four new, very large science centers this year and next year as well. So we're opening, I think, two this year and opening two more next year. So there will be one here, there will be one here, some of the bigger ones, and there will be another one here and another one there as well. And these guys here, if you looked at the population of Poland, most of it lives either in Warsaw or in this area. So even though there's already a lot of science centers there, not enough. So expect about five more coming here. Uh, we're kind of at a stage where almost every larger town in Poland decided recently they want to have their own science center. Uh, so basically everybody's building those. They're hoping to have about 100,000 visitors per year uh, in comparison to Copernicus uh, million. And these are just examples of some of the science centers we have. This is the oldest one. Doesn't look like the old, very old one, right? I think it's about 12 to 15 years old. Um, it was built actually as part of technological park in, in uh, Gdynia, uh, part of their drive towards making Gdynia and the northern part of Poland more innovative. So they built labs, etc. It's kind of like Unit City, really, but as, with a science center um, as a part of it. <laughs> and they, so the half of this building is a science center, the other half is labs. Um, there are some old school ones, so like this one, in the past there was a granary, and people would store grain inside, and then grain was removed many years ago, and they fixed up the building, it's an old building made of brick, and then actually rebuilt it into a, a very large science center in Torun, uh, where Copernicus lived and studied. Um, so this is called now the mill of knowledge, and this is experiment. Um, this is a very interesting one down in the bottom because uh, it's actually a science center to do with geology. Um, large part of it is underground. They have a cave system next to it. If you go to the science center, you kind of just get a very quick glimpse into what geology is about and then you go into the caves with geologists and learn about uh, the cave systems in the area. Um, and this in here is the Copernicus Science Center, which we opened eight years ago. And all of those now, after the first couple of years, everybody was working independently. And then we figured out it would be much better if we actually collaborated. But we need like a, a place to meet and talk about all these ideas. Some science centers were already about to open, but didn't know how to do a science center. Others were working for eight years, for example, but started losing some of the audiences or they wanted to try something new. So we created this thing, SPIN, which is an association of society and science, is what we call it. And we basically decided to create one association um, that each of the science centers in Poland can be a member of. So we have yearly conferences where everybody from science centers comes to one place and talk about you know, some of the things we've done, some of the things we would like others to maybe do with us. And we start larger sort of inter, maybe not international, international projects as well, but inter-regional um, projects around Poland. Because the first five or six science centers decided to create association put money into it. This is 100% self-financed by, by science centers. And others coming from all around Poland were coming to these conferences saying like, this is so cool, what do you guys talk about in here? We would like to have something like that in our city. How do we go about actually building one? And then you had a wealth of knowledge in form of all these people coming to these conferences saying like, I can help you. Or I'm actually from Krakow, but I work in this place in Warsaw. But if you guys told me you're building a science center back in Krakow, I'll be happy to leave my job here, go to Krakow and become a director in an entirely new institution. So I have to say some of our first biggest science centers were kind of incubators for people that would learn how to run a science center and go and become directors in others. So out of Copernicus Science Center, there's at least 25 people working in other science centers in Poland as directors or deputy directors or heads of departments, etc. Now, even though in our science center there were specialists or there were explainers, basically walking around exhibitions and explaining exhibitions. Um, so that's 
awesome how that works. I think we're li reaching the limit where there is no more space for large science centers in Poland. So we'll basically saturate the market uh, pretty soon and then we'll start working differently and I can tell you more about it later. So this is kind of how it works. Altogether in Poland now we have 45 science centers of many different varieties. Um, many of them specialize. So this is the science centers and later on I will tell you a story of Copernicus and I'll tell you more about Copernicus itself. Now, these are some of the large-scale engagement, um, science engagement events that we do in Poland. Some of them are international in nature. So, for example, you might recognize World Space Week um, in Poland. This is happening every year in Wroclaw, that I know many people in here have been to. Um, so, Wroclaw organizes a very large conference and a sort of science picnic festival show um, all about uh, space. So, everybody else from Poland goes to there. The, the, everything, everything else that is related to, to space, all the people working on that will try and go to Wroclaw and then showcase what they are doing. Um, we have, this is actually what started Copernicus. When I told you about a couple of tents in Warsaw, it was called the Warsaw Science Picnic. And it was organized by just two guys initially. There was one guy who was a scientist, a physicist at the University of Warsaw, and a sort of a crazy guy, uh, Professor Łukasz Tulski, who had this crazy idea, you know, we want to do something like that. We want to communicate science. And then there was another guy called Robert Firmhofer, who was um, a director and in a radio. And he was like, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it like better than just uh, single events here and there. So they started organizing an annual picnic in Warsaw in the park. And after a couple of years, they started getting more and more and more professional. And they got some sponsorships and some funding from the city of Warsaw, etc., etc. And at some point, it was growing so large, they actually had to hire an office in Warsaw to run the tents in the park. <laughs> and they started assembling a group of people working um, on these tents. And at some point, they figured out it would be nice to actually have you know, a, a permanent place for the picnics. So they lobbied the city of Warsaw and finally they got a promise that there will be a place next to the river, Vistula, in the middle of Warsaw where they will get a science center. Nobody knew what the science center is going to be like, but they're going to get like a, a big building and they can put stuff inside. Um, so then they started assembling a team that was going to build the science center. None of them have ever built anything in their lives, so it was a challenge. And then they had to find people who were engineers who were going to put and construct um, activities and exhibitions for inside, etc. Et so it was a very long process, uh, but initially it was done by a very small group of people. Uh, literally less than 10 people that were initially working on that. Uh, so when I hear, you know, for example, oh, well, maybe in a hundred years we'll get there, uh, you know what, sometimes there's, it's enough to have two, three, four, five, seven people and you can start with that. And you'll be surprised where you can get in just two or three or five years. Um, so, but the picnic is still going. So back then, you know, initially there was like a 10 visitors, 100 visitors, 1,000 visitors. Uh, we have a hundred thousand visitors, <laughs> uh, typically. Some years, uh, good weather, so we go to a hundred thousand. Bad weather, we go to fifty thousand, but we oscillate between these two values. Um, so it's a huge picnic now. We actually have to rent a stadium uh, to do it now. Park is not big enough uh, to organize it in the park, or basically the, the grass would be demolished there. So this is still going. It's already the 21st science picnic happening in Warsaw now. Um, there are events such as the ERC, the um, European Rover Challenge. I know Robert is going to ERC pretty soon. Um, so this is a, a competition that's organized in Poland for many years now, where um, people that design and build rovers, Martian rovers, can go and then basically compete with one another into who built the biggest, the best, the, the fastest, the most articulate, etc., etc., uh, rover. And at the same time, around it, there is a science picnic and a science festival where people are interested in, in Mars and in space exploration can come and show off their own stuff and, and talk about it. Um, there is, you might recognize this one, the March for Science. This has been happening all around the world. Um, there is, a, in Poland, we have a March for Science as well. I don't know if you have one in Ukraine. So there is one in Poland as well. Uh, there is a festival of science, which is what I mentioned to you on the beginning. The couple of lectures happening at universities here and there, that then started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now, as I said, what happens is the newspaper, um, one of the biggest newspapers in Poland, when the festival happens in Warsaw, they have to release like a second newspaper with just a list of lectures on that day. And lectures and activities and workshops, etc. Et so it's huge. And it also spread to other cities. So 
everything I'm telling you about now, so the picnic and the festival, this is happening in Warsaw, but almost every other large Polish town has its own picnic and its own festival. So basically every town organizes one, uh, even smaller towns. There is the Copernicus Festival, which is hugely interesting. This is organized in Krakow, and uh, it's a festival about philosophy and science. Absolutely amazing. If you ever have a chance and, and understand a little bit of Polish, do go. Uh, I think it's one of the most interesting science festivals in Europe. I'm not organizing it and I have nothing to do with it. I just love to go and listen. Uh, I have to do with almost everything else, but this I have nothing to do with. It's amazing. Uh, there are people who are um, interested in religion and science and how to merge the two, or at least not argue with one another as much as we do now. There are people interested in how this is going to have an impact on us as humans in general, how society is going to be changed by some of the things that we develop now in, and some of the technologies that we, we create. So very interesting sort of humanist approach to science. Um, very much recommend that. There is the Noc Museo, so the Night of Museums. I don't know if you have it in Ukraine. Very popular in Poland now as well. Again, every town has one. Uh, I remember when it started. I remember the first one that I went to. It was amazing. There was two museums in Warsaw that opened in the night. I was like, yeah. Obviously now, like in many other towns and countries, every museum wants to have its, its night. So everything opens. And in Warsaw, uh, we have you know special buses taking people. And so there's free buses for the entire evening. And there are free trams. And there's a free tube, etc., etc. Because people travel so much, there's no time for, for tickets. Um, it's an amazing evening. Um, so this is just a selection of large-scale events that, again, if I wanted to look at about 10 years ago, there were a couple of small ones. So this was much, much smaller. Um, you know, this was, again, for like a meeting of a couple of academics talking about philosophy of science. Many of these things started as a, a couple of people having an idea, or one institution having an idea, or two institutions getting together and saying, how about instead of you open for the night, uh, there is this idea around the world, maybe we all open for the night, and we just give it a try and see whether it works or not. Um, so I'm always amazed by what a couple of people with an idea can do. Um, so that's science engagement events, uh, but we also have science media. That's a selection of uh, media uh, in Poland that publish about science. Uh, so there is the, the Knowledge and Life, one of the oldest in Poland. There is Urania. Urania is uh, basically an astronomy-related uh, science popularization magazine, which is the oldest um, science engagement magazine in Poland. It has been going for, I think, over 70 years permanently. Um, we have Focus, uh, which is kind of more a sci-pop. Um, there is Newsweek uh, Science. Uh, Newsweek has its own separate version of Newsweek in Poland that's only about science. You can buy Newsweek Normal or you can buy Newsweek Science. Um, politics, no politics at all. <laughs> so it's your choice. <laughs> I write for this one, I don't write for the other one. <laughs> Um, there is Delta, which is fantastic. It's a, it's a science popularizing magazine for mathematicians. Um, um, if you ever come across it, get it. It's really interesting, especially because most of the stuff inside is mathematics. You don't even need to need, you know Polish. Uh, mathematics is universal. Um, and I love this one. It started only uh, last year, thanks to fundraising, uh, sort of crowd, crowdsourcing and fundraising. Um, it's called Cosmos dla Dziewczynek, so um, Cosmos for Girls. And it's a magazine that's designed by a bunch of girls um, with this one idea that they go, they have a foundation, they go to little girls and ask them, um, what, are you what are you interested in when it comes to space exploration? And they are allowed to write articles only that fit what the girls are interested in. And it's fascinating because typically there's far less, I would say, hard technology in here and far more of human space flight and human biology and human physiology, etc., etc. But there's all the other stuff as well. Uh, it's just that it's displayed in ways that I've never seen before. Far more colorful, um, far more sort of human-centered. And uh, so far uh, they got fundraised, they got basically, uh, they used um, like Polish version of Kickstarter to get enough money to uh, f have some of the first issues and then they had to move into like normal business model and it works. Um, 
So this is just the, the publication. On the other hand, we have traditional uh, media like the bigger ones. So we have Sonda, uh, Sonda Squared, Sonda 2. Um, back in the communist times in Poland, there was a, a TV show about science called Sonda. And out of all TV shows back then, people hated all of them apart from this one. And people really missed this one for many years. It wasn't there. And then the Polish TV decided to reinstate it and start a, a brand new um, science show on, on, on TVP, so the, one of the main Polish uh, channels. It's hugely popular. Um, so this guy, who was a, like a normal guy popularizing science, is a massive celebrity in Poland right now. Um, but it's just on TV. There is so many science shows on radio as well. Um, I, I don't even have enough space here to show all of them. Um, some of them collaborate with science popularizers, some of them with scientists that are happy to, to talk about science. Um, this guy, one here, she is a, a doctor of I forgot, biology, I think. So she basically talks to other scientists. So this is more highbrow and for people who know something about science and want to learn more. This is totally opposite. This is a channel for, for youngsters, for teenagers. So this is kind of fun approach to talking about science. And there is the online media. There is some media that talks specifically about one area. For example, there is a very large website in Poland called Space24. 24, 24 hours of space coverage. <laughs> I'm there every day <laughs> because I love space. Um, and it's very good, very informative, um, with uh, sort of in depth uh, interviews with people who are in the space sector. And I highly recommend it even to use uh, Google Translate on it because sometimes it's much better to read than many of the sources I read in English. Um, there's YouTube channels like SciFun, which is watched by 40% of Polish teenagers, uh, which is an insane number. And if you ask teachers in Poland where do their kids get ideas about science from, 40% of them say that their kids get most of the interesting ideas from YouTube, um, and specifically from that channel. <laughs> There is just one guy who started it. Um, and we have blogs that are hugely popular as well. There is We Need More Space, which is sort of an edgy hipster blog on space. Totally different take to this, more I'm wearing a suit and I'm serious um, space industry insider. Um, so these guys are more about like, we have some swag t-shirts that you can ex basically show around and, and show some love for space. Um, so there's like something for everybody. And, uh, and there's lots of NGOs and businesses in Poland now specifically targeting science communication. So on the bottom, you can see businesses related to PR in science. So there is a special science PR agency called mm -hmm, <laughs> Science PR. Um, they assist, um, basically, if, for example, if there is a university in Poland that have, there is a scientist there who made an interesting discovery and they would like to tell the world about it. These are guys who are pretty good in actually popularizing that, um, not only in Poland, but across the world as well. They do a lot of publications, they can organize events, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So typically too busy to even do anything else. If you contacted them tomorrow to ask whether they can help you with something, no, most likely they will say, we already have too much to do. Um, and they're kind of, so there's place for, I think, a couple more companies like this one. Um, and there's Planet PR, for example, um, a science PR agency targeted specifically towards space sector and space markets and space aficionados. Uh, so these guys organize the ERC as well. And many of these people, many of these businesses are kind of like, it's hard to sometimes say whether they are businesses or not. Yes, they make money, but these guys are so passionate that quite often they organize events as, as volunteers as well or, or in, in a mode of, uh, of doing it pro bono. So these guys do their lots of interesting space popularization for money and at the same time organize huge events like ERC because they figure, oh, let's do it. Um, and these two are NGOs, um, some of the bigger NGOs in Poland related to communicating science, but have totally different uh, approaches. Rzecznicy um, Nauki, so the spokesmen and spokeswomen of science, is an association that was created next to Copernicus Science Center. It basically, the idea there was, we have a lot of people in Poland popularizing science, and some of them are becoming professional science popularizers. The only trouble is many of them have never actually done science. It's kind of like, I'm so passionate about science, I've read a lot about it, and I want to tell others. 
and it's cool. I mean, this is so these people most likely understand something about the, the science they are talking about, and they know why it caught their interest. So they're very good in actually catching other people's interest as well. The only trouble is that if you start asking them questions about, okay, so how this is done specifically, and then they're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know exactly how it's done specifically. It's like, so for example, you ask them, um, all right, so you're talking about some space exploration stuff. So what's the technology readiness level at this point? And they're like, technology. Well, uh, Michael mentioned earlier so-called TRLs. If somebody is in the space sector, in the space business, they will know what, what this is about. But if you're just reading about it online and then trying to repeat it, well, you wouldn't have heard about it most likely. Uh, so you, know, you cannot do like a deeper coverage of that, of that area. It would be cool if there was an astronomer, for example, or an astrophysicist, or somebody in the space industry who is very knowledgeable about it, but at the same time, good in communicating this knowledge. And the trouble is that, for some reason in Poland, at least for many years, these two sets were completely separate. There's like people that know stuff and people that can tell stuff. <laughs> and there was like this, on this Venn diagram, there's like this tiny overlap. Here are some amazing people that know stuff and can tell stuff. But there's like two of them in the entire country. So uh, what Copernicus decided to do is actually run an entire competition for these people. To even take part in the competition, you have to at least start a PhD and you have to be a scientist. But to win a competition, you have to talk about science well. And then people started winning this competition, going abroad and then winning awards abroad as well, etc., etc. And they figured, you know what, it would be so awesome if these people didn't just like disperse, but if they created like a movement. So Copernicus decided to start organizing events in Copernicus Science Center called the Spokesmen of Science. And what they did is they invited the winners of this competition from one side and then science journalists from the other side, just to kind of like do speed dating, pair them, etc., etc. And they were hoping that the journalists will start working with the science communicators and scientists. But what happened was that these guys started working with one another so much that at some point um, they created their association and, and now work as a very large group of people that, that does it quite a lot. Um, and I'll tell you even more about it in a second because I'm one of the people that actually created this NGO. Uh, I'm one of the scientists that actually was in one of this competition and I, this is sort of what brought me to professional science communication. And on the other, in the other corner, we have Polonium Foundation. That's a slightly different idea. Here the idea was that um, here we're pulling only from scientists in Poland, but Polish people have a huge diaspora around the world. I know Ukrainians have exactly the same. There's millions of us out there in many different places and in many very interesting places. So, you know, Polish people work at NASA and Polish people work at ESA and Polish people work at some of the best universities around the world. Some of the worst as well, obviously. Um, and the idea is, well, we have so many experts out there working where stuff happens, right? If you, if you read about a space mission being built in France, well, you can find a science popularizer in Poland who's going to do a, an interesting job telling about it. But maybe you have a scientist there in France working on the mission and he could talk about that. So we figured it would be so interesting to actually bring all these people together. Um, and the idea was, and I'm already saying we, because I also created this NGO. <laughs> so the idea there was to bring Polish people from all around the world and start talking about the sort of popular science concepts together and see what comes out of it. There was no like big plan where we're gonna get. There was not even a plan for a foundation. So to do a slightly deeper dive, the first NGO, this is the one, the spokesman of science, Suchnitsa Nauki, how it works now is that it basically is a sort of a loose association of about 50 people. All of them have to be scientists. Uh, we work kind of like the Royal Astronomical Society or the Royal Society or any other, like for example, specifically British societies. If you want to get inside, you have to have two recommendations from members. So basically, at least two members of the, of the society have had to notice you somewhere as a good scientist and a good popularizer. And they write recommendations that maybe it would be interesting to have you on board and send it to the rest of the society, the rest of the association, who then votes on whether we accept that person or not. So it's a sort of exclusive club of people where we want to be sure that everybody who's a part of it, we can really put them out there as spokespeople of science sort of representing science. And if somebody does a bad job, for example, if somebody gives a talk that's not you know, very accurate, 
there are ways to basically strike that person from the list. Because we want to make sure that if somebody contacts one of the spokespeople of science, he actually represents the actual proper sort of scientific knowledge. And how it works now is that we have a website you can go to, it's in English as well, which basically lists, the list goes down, there's a list of interesting people, experts that we have on board. And you can select by the different fields, so there is biology, uh, social sciences, physics, uh, ecology, etc, etc. So this is just a simple way of, uh, of filtering. We have advanced filters as well, so you can, if you are, for example, a media specialist and you're thinking, huh, I have this interesting story about biology, who do I call? I have this one professor I always call, um, he doesn't do a very interesting job, but mm, that's the only contact I have. You can go here and then, well, select biology and you'll see a list of people that specifically work in the field of biology right now. And we can recommend them as good mm, spokespeople. Uh, they will do an interesting job enough if you invite them to your TV or radio, etc. And we will be sure that what they put out there is accurate scientifically, but at the same time interesting. But what happens also is that apart from the, and we can, maybe I'll switch sides. So what you can see was the result. We actually invented it for people to go to the media and, and provide accurate coverage of scientific events and discoveries. Um, but these are things that we currently do out of, for example, this is just last year, well, this year. So far, our members have done something interesting. We put everything we do, we put on a list. They've done something interesting already 72 times. Um, 42% of that was media, um, basically being on a TV, radio, etc., etc. But interestingly enough, there's the second group here, 26% of the time we were doing events. So people basically invite us to, to events to talk about science, to show what is it like to be a scientist, etc., etc. Um, this part here, 10%, is grants. We actually pair up with other scientists to secure grants for science um, projects. Oftentimes, there are science projects that require scientists to actually communicate what they discover. And some scientists don't know how to do it. So they call us saying, can you like team up with us? So when we discover something, you guys help us straight away communicate it. So we apply for grants together as a scientist and a science communicator that understands science. And, and these are all the other stuff. And many of them are just projects. And some of them are commercial projects. Quite often we're contacted by companies saying, we would like to have a scientist uh, tell us something or explain something to us or build a game with us or create um, a computer game with us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So most of these things are, or these are like articles written for, for written publications, et cetera. So most of these stuff are other projects. And the cool thing about all of this is, and you can see some of the members in here, cool thing about all of this is some of that is commercially viable. So we have nothing against the fact that our members get paid for what they do. So if they want to, you know, they're scientists, if they are asked to write an article, they ask for a fee uh, because it's their time. Uh, if somebody asks them to take part in an event, they ask for a fee. And as a result, um, I can't give you the exact number, but and we don't like store money centrally. It's not that the association gets money from, from our clients and then we pass the money down to the members of the association. The money kind of flows directly into their hands or sometimes through the association. But there's at least hundreds of thousands of Polish waters that flow through the um, association every year. So if it is a sort of a self-sustainable vehicle, vehicle at this point. Um, and it is growing now further and further and further. And I can talk a lot about what else do we do and all the projects that we do, etc. But please ask me, ask me later. Um, one project I wanted to show you is the first science stand-up we did in Poland, which was awesome. You'll not understand it, just wanted to show you the, the vibes. There was a chance to make the most I took part as well. Wish poza tak zwany comfort zone. Wish poza ten to miejsce gdzie jest się tym autorytetem. A na scenie komediowej stoi, ale wszyscy wypikują na bieżąco i do tego to jest coś, czego my kompletnie nie umiemy robić. A moim zdaniem by się bardzo przydało. Wychodzimy na scenę, żeby się pośmiać, więc to nie jest wykład, gdzie siedzą złośliwi naukowcy, którzy będą wytykać nam każdy błąd, oceniać nas. Tu wszyscy przyszliśmy dobrze się bawić. Nie ma tremy. Wykładam na co dzień, więc to jest dla mnie bardzo podobne doświadczenie. Jest to Eksperyment. Yeah. 
I, I know you don't understand Polish. <laughs> Just kind of wanted to show you scientists as fish out of the water in a, in a comedy club in the basement with beer and everything. Uh, it was an amazing night. I, I performed on stage as well. This was the scariest thing I've done in my entire life. But the funny thing was if somebody came to me and said, hey, you know what, we have this idea, um, science stand-up. I was like, I've never done stand-up in my life. I don't even know if I can crack a single joke. Uh, at least not prepared. Uh, unprepared, maybe. And then there's a, like, and you go on stage, people will pay for it. And you'll be talking to a, a bunch of drunk people about science. It's like, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but because we have this association, and they came to the association saying, how about you, a whole bunch? We'll give you three days of workshops on how to do stand-up. All of you together. Uh, improvisation, stand-up, stuff like that. And then you'll go on stage, people will pay for tickets, and you'll have to make the entire room laugh. And we were just like, oh, <laughs> I'm not like, do you want to ask? Oh, you kind of want to, uh, yeah, you want to do it? You want to do it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm totally going to do it. And what ended up was like all of us being sort of like sitting on a fence, but everybody else was doing the same. So finally somebody said, I'll do it. And everybody else was like, yeah, 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 me too. And as a result, there were, I think, 15 people all together that tried doing that. We took three, uh, part in the three-day workshops. Uh, 14 people learned how to do stand-up. I didn't. <laughs> and by the end of it, <laughs> the guy who organized it said, yeah, 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 all of you are ready apart from Cuba. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I, I prepared like this routine and I'll be doing this. He's like, no, 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 no. Um, hmm. Yesterday, you told me a really interesting anecdote. <laughs> Just go on stage and say it again. <laughs> so that's what I did, and it was very well received. Uh, so this was the first ever science stand-up in Poland. And since then, there was another one as well, and we started doing it in English and going to other events, etc., etc. And it's just this amazing way of showing that, you know, scientists do not have to be uptight. We don't have to be always like wearing a suit, etc. We can just have fun um, in a bar as well. And, and I have to say, I have never laughed in my life as much as there. If you can guys organize something like that here in Ukraine, you will have the best night of your lives, trust me. Just find a group of people motivated and interesting and courageous enough to actually take part in it. Yeah, yeah. It was, sorry? A science slam? Mm -hmm. Science Slam events mm. when again the idea was to present um, well your science in a funny way yeah and also people are sort of you know relaxed mm. and you're well you need to make them laugh mm -hmm. out of your research basically yeah sounds similar uh, you know I think stand up is kind of more like it's more more kind of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> than, than, than science itself, it's joke science related, but yes, yeah, slam or anything else that you'd like or to organize that's so, similar. So you did jokes yeah. about science, not just general anecdotes, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so there were, all of it was related, so, um, you know, there was uh, a lot of, so for example, somebody who is a biologist or a chemist would talk about how pissing on a frog uh, changes its color and how this was used in the past as a way of sensing whether women were pregnant or not, um, for example. Another person, there is a couple of scientists that are a marriage, so they described what, how does it work to be a marriage of two scientists and you know how scientifically to convince your spouse to clean up the house uh, because there is scientific proof that it's dirty enough. Uh, and then the other person says, well, it depends on where you set the threshold <laughs> for dirtiness. And so, yeah, lots of jokes related to science, but this is not to popularize a specific concept in science, although in many cases this is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Somebody was preparing an anecdote on a specific scientific topic and then telling a joke to others and others were like, I don't understand, like, why is it funny? It's like, oh, yeah, I need to include something so that people know what I'm talking about. Yeah? Can you tell the same anecdote? Uh, <laughs> Uh, it takes, so my routine was, I think, about 10, 15 minutes, um, but I can tell you later, yeah. <laughs> if you, if you uh, find me later with a coffee or something, I'm happy to repeat it for you. So, uh, so that was the, the association. Now, the second part is the foundation, um, so as I said, the guys all around the world. And this all started with this, uh, Science Polish Perspectives. Um, basically, what it is, is a conference um, that we organized in Oxford for the first time in 2012. So it's six years ago. Two people 
that were like, yeah, let's do a conference for Polish scientists from all around the world. And then they did it. And I remember I came to the first one and it was amazing. It was so fun to talk to so many other Polish people from so many nations and compare and contrast how doing science in Poland and, um, and Ukraine and Germany and France and Britain and US, etc. How what are the differences, what are the similarities? And it broadened my perspective so much. And all of the talks we did were, were just popular science talks. No, like pure science, just popular science. Then we decided to organize another one in Cambridge a year later, and we had a team of seven this time, and got a lot of funding to do it, hundreds of thousands at this point, from companies and from universities and from foundations for science, etc., etc. And people traveled again from all around the world, and we kept organizing though year after year after year after year, and then we figured this is so cool because we are creating like the community of Polish scientists abroad, and there never was one. Um, if you were at the university and there was another Polish scientist at the university the same city, you, there was no way for you to learn about that unless you had like some personal connection. So the, the result was that we decided to create a foundation that will help this conference happen every year. And the moment we created it, it turned out that people in Berlin want to have one as well, and the people in Stockholm want to have one as well, and people in Florence in Italy want to have one as well. So we started organizing smaller um, um, conferences called meetups. And some of the meetups got so big, they became conferences, like Berlin is so big, there are so many Polish researchers in Germany, they want to have their own conference. So we started creating conferences all over the world, basically, for Polish scientists, so they don't have to travel so much. And then the Kosciuszko Foundation, which funds um, Polish scientists travel around the world decided to create a Polish science and innovation meetup out of it, which happens in the US. Um, and because it started growing so, so high, we created this foundation which then started doing other projects. And that includes, in here on the right, we've actually hired researchers to do research on Polish scientists around the world. So this year we're releasing a report on what are the motivations of Polish scientists to be around the world, what would convince them to come back to Poland, how to change brain drain into brain circulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and again, this idea came up two years ago. Uh, we secured funding. Uh, this year we have a result. Next year, Polish Ministry of Science can start using it to actually change brain drain into circulation. The idea came from two people. Um, they were just motivated to do it. Uh, we do from Poland with science. I like it. Uh, this is um, a program we run in Britain. Um, Polish scientists travel to Britain and tell British audiences about the Polish science that we do, the, the science done by Polish people all around the world. Um, and we write reports that are supposed to influence the way science is done in Poland. The coolest thing about all that is all these scientists work and live, most of them work and live outside of Poland. And they are not afraid of Polish scientific establishment one bit. If somebody comes to them, even the Minister of Science that says, oh, you should be doing this, and like, I'm not gonna do that because I work in Toronto or in Stockholm or in Florence or somewhere else, and I don't care what you say. If you attract me to come back to Poland and work there, that's okay, I can come and I can set up my own group in Poland. But if you annoy me, if something is wrong with this science in Poland, or if you don't listen to me, dear Ministry of Science or dear foundations or national science centers, what I'll do is I'll pack my bags and go somewhere else because I can because I'm a very good scientist, very well connected around the world. I don't have to be here. I'm here only if I want to be here. And if you want me to be here, you have to create conditions that will attract me to stay here. And I, I can't overstate how important and powerful this idea is. Because the conversations we have on these meetings, we have policy makers, we have the head of the science Polish, uh, Polish policy coming to this meeting almost every year. We had vice ministers, etc., etc., um, heads of departments, heads of universities coming to this meeting because it's a free forum where everybody can say what they think and nobody can sort of criticize them and say, well, if you say that, I'll cut off your funding. People say, I don't care. I'll just go and find funding somewhere else because I'm good enough and I'm well connected enough. So it's this amazing place where you can discuss uh, not only science but policy of science in Poland as well. But it's called Science Polish Perspectives because everybody is interested in how science is conducted in Poland. And people from abroad weigh in with their own ideas and their own um, uh, thoughts on how we could do that. Um, so this, is, this results in reports like this one, which then says what do we think people in Poland could change. And the funny thing is, it works. Um, after a couple of years of organizing these events, now in Poland, the Ministry of Science created an entirely new institution, which is called NAVA, and it's created to make sure the brain drain changes into brain circulation, and then we have an institution that is designed to help Polish scientists coming from abroad. 
and it has funding for that, it has special grants for people returning to Poland, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And some of its policy is influenced by, by what we do here. And the foundation is so successful actually, we, when we created it two years ago, in 2016, we put in 4,000 zlotys into the bank, which is 1,000 euro. And I remember we were like, yeah, we're such founders. <laughs> 1,000 euro foundation, <laughs> the grants we're gonna give. <laughs> Go and get yourself an ice cream. <laughs> That's all we have money for. So we were quite surprised uh, that it actually worked out. And this year, uh, the budget of the foundation is one million zlotys. And we're only getting started. Um, and again, this was initiated by a couple of people who just had an idea. And I'm really surprised that in two years' time, we have a million in the bank, uh, secured funding for the next couple of years and we started hiring the first people to actually manage the entire foundation. We have accountants, we have managers, we have project leaders, we have the scientific team, etc, etc. And the trouble we have now is how to quickly hire enough people to actually continue the mission of the foundation. So that's this side and now I'm getting to Copernicus. Um, how many of you have actually been to Copernicus Science Center? So there's about four or five people. So most of you haven't. So here it is. <laughs> That's how it looks like from outside. <laughs> and uh, I have a quick video to show how it actually looks like from the inside as well. So this is the main hall with the Foucault uh, pendulum. And lots of small exhibitions here and there. The whole idea of the science uh, museum is to go and experiment yourself. Um, and these are labs that we also have inside. So just to quickly show you um, what it is. So the whole idea of Science Centers actually started in San Francisco, in Exploratorium. And the idea was to have a museum where, you know, typically in museums you come in, look, don't touch. They had the opposite idea. Come in, touch, move, break, do anything you want with it. I mean, it's our job to create things that you cannot break. And if you break them, we need to make better things. Uh, it's not you should break them less. Um, or you should not experiment with them this way or another way. We will have explainers everywhere. So if you struggle with figuring out what is this circle for, they might try and explain it to you. But not explain everything. Just say, try moving it and see what happens. So the whole idea of a science center is to explore for yourself. Come in, try doing experiments like scientists would do. But I would say this is like exploratory research. So experiment with something and try to build in your head an idea of what you're looking at. And this is reflected in the mission that we have. And these are the three goals that we set ourselves. We have sort of the three strategic goals. One is we currently have a million guests every year and we want to keep having a million guests because it provides us with steady source of income and because we want to have an impact on a wider world. Um, if you have a million visitors every year, 40 million people in Poland, that means that over a couple of years you'll reach a quarter or half of the entire population of the country. And that's significant. And we want to basically make sure that all of them have an amazing experience because we want them to keep coming and keep going away thinking, whoa, this whole science thing is amazing. I want to do more of that. Um, but we, the second goal we have is that we want to support the art of learner-focused education. Oftentimes education is about, well, so I'm a teacher, everybody here, we're going to learn today about topic A. 90% of you are not interested, tough luck. Um, we have a totally opposite approach. The museum is too big for you to see. Go and find things that are interesting to you. And when we measure how long do people interact with um, exhibition pieces, it's typically two to three seconds. Because people do like, uh, no, um, oh, okay, uh, no, uh, oh, so, ah, actually, how does that work? And then we see people bouncing off, for example, six or seven exhibition pieces and then getting stuck on one for 15 minutes or so. The average time people spend in our museum, when they buy a ticket, they can stay for almost the entire day, and they spend about three to four hours, in average. Uh, so they can come in and be there, you know, leave in one hour, but that's not what happens. And we want to encourage participation in culture shaped by science. Um, so this is a, a mouthful. Typically how we describe it is, we want to have science, heart, society. <laughs> in both ways. It's almost like a meme. We want to have the, the scientists 
that actually love society, that go out and, and try and figure out what society wants and try to answer at least some of these questions. And then we want society to love science, to figure out what science is about, know science, get closer to science. So I think I'll be running out of time very soon. So what I wanted to show you is just um, very quickly who visits us. So currently, oops, we have a million one hundred ten thousand visitors. Um, this was last year, 2017. Um, 805,000 of them were, came for the exhibition. The rest uh, went to the planetarium. We have a planetarium as well. Uh, and what we do, one of the interesting things, we also have an internal R&D institute. Copernicus is not only a science center, it is an R&D center that researches how to do science communication. So we have a team of researchers on board that we employ to research what works and what doesn't. So if somebody comes to us later on and says, oh, you've done something interesting, I'd like to do something similar, then we can actually show a, a paper saying, and this is how this should be done. Uh, and we publish most of our reports online. And when it comes to education level, funnily enough, 60% are primary or middle school, but 30% are higher education, uh, higher people after higher education, so basically adults. Uh, so we're very happy uh, with that. And we are visited by, if you look at where do people come from, 7% of the school trips come from Warsaw, everybody else comes from around Poland. So we basically have visitors from the entire nation. These are our exhibitions. So if you see, these are two plants. We have the ground floor and we have the first floor. The blue and the green parts are where exhibitions are. And what are the rest? We have shops and restaurants here on the bottom. And this entire space is our very large conference center where we organize events. Um, and that's just to quickly show you the whole range of things that we do. Um, the cool thing is that we give all our staff members that we have 300 of. We started with only a couple, um, eight years later we had 300 um, permanent staff employed in Copernicus and about 200 explainers and thousands of subcontractors. Um, so there's a lot of people working with Copernicus now. And the cool thing is all these are our employees. We actually allow our employees to use the center as much as they want and when they want. So everybody can just go and, and have fun at uh, exhibitions and learn about them and then think of ways of how they can improve them. So anybody at any point can have any suggestion of what we should change. They go to the exhibition department and these guys just change things. Um, many of the exhibition pieces that we have um, on the exhibition are actually uh, prototypes. We have this prototype area, we define here is a prototype area. This exhibition piece might not work as well as others, please experiment with them. And there's a researcher standing there and being like, okay, they broke this. <laughs> okay, this needs to be bigger, this needs to be smaller, or this is boring, nobody's here. Um, so we put things up and then we see what happens with them and we put them down. We have a very large basement where there's workshops. We fix things up and change them and then put them back up. Um, and this is the team of people that actually create exhibitions. We are one of the few science centers that actually creates almost all of its exhibitions. Many other science centers go to companies that make science exhibitions and just buy them. Uh, what we do is most of our exhibitions are built by ourselves so we can improve them and test them and research them. Uh, so we can add, for example, a small, if you want to research, for example, if having a louder or quieter exhibition piece is going to work better, well, we can make it louder or quieter and see what works and what's the impact of on our visitors. Um, if you buy an exhibition from an external supplier, it's much harder to do it because if you want to increase the loudness or decrease, they're going to say, well, in the contract you said it's supposed to be this. If you want to increase it now, well, we have to sign a new contract. And it's typically hugely expensive and takes a lot of time. But we also have visiting exhibitions. So, for example, this is a visiting exhibition about air that was developed outside of Poland, came to Poland, and we just set it up. We have an area for, for uh, visitor exhibitions. And what you can see flying in here is an art piece that we actually commissioned. So there is a Polish artist who created this floating exhibition uh, piece that basically moves around all the time. Um, but we also partner with companies. So this is a partnership with Samsung. We figured people are interested in how everyday equipment works. So we have an exhibition part where Samsung gives us their stuff like they give us like 20 TV screens and we can break them and put them apart and open them and see what's inside and then remake them into exhibition pieces. So for example, you can tinker um, with a TV and see how it works or you can use a microscope to have a very close look at how the, the part of a TV set works. 
or we can change colors, etc. etc. And we have an art exhibition space. Outside of Copernicus, right next to it, there is a pavilion where we have art exhibitions. And anybody walking down the river can just go inside and go into a, a gallery. But the gallery has art pieces related to science. And we have an external place as well. So outside of Copernicus, there's a large park where we do outside stuff. We do lectures, we do talks, etc. etc. And, uh, and we have some uh, exhibition activities as well. So this is just a, a short list of things we can do at exhibitions, not just exhibition pieces. Um, we have small sort of tables where people do experiments. We have groups that demonstrate things. We have a high voltage theater, which is here. So basically we have Tesla coils and Van der Graaff generators inside of a massive Faraday cage, and we can make lightning. And people go inside for half an hour and basically almost get zapped to death, but survive every time. Uh, we have Thinkatorium, which is what you can see here. Kids come in and get a challenge, build a bridge out of wood and see how hard it is and how you need to use scientific principles to actually be able to do it. And we have mini workshops for 20 minutes. You can go into labs or you can go into other open spaces and then take part in a very short uh, workshop. And we also do things for adults um, or for families. We have family workshops where whole families come in and learn about science together. We do lectures in the planetarium that are actually for families and, and for adults as well. Uh, we have music at the planetarium. Every Friday, there's a classical music concert under the stars. And the stars are improvised to the music. And to go a step further, we have jazz concerts once a month that are improvised. And the sky is improvised to them. So you walk into the planetarium, sit down, and there's a jazz band that starts jazzing. And there's a guy on the back that then moves the sky to match with the music. And the moment they all synchronize is amazing. I even have my hair standing up right now just thinking about it. And then we have after hours evenings for adults. Once a month, we close the science center for kids and have only adults coming in. And we have drinks and topics that are adult only. My favorite was there is a researcher in Poland that studies pornography and what a social scientist can learn from Pornhub. I have to say, the best ever lecture in my life. <laughs> it's amazing what, you can, what people tell this website <laughs> without knowing. A very powerful tell, uh, apparently, uh, tool for scientists. And we have a science bus, because we figure we're one science center, not everybody can come to us. So we have two buses that basically we load exhibitions onto and travel all around Poland. We visit hundreds of towns every uh, year. The deal is the town has to be 100,000 uh, inhabitants or less, so basically small towns. And these guys come in, open up, stay there for one or two days, close and go somewhere else. And everybody from the town can come in. Typically these are set up in schools and we have two different um, ideas. And this year, uh, two different ex exhibitions. And this year we actually added a planet bus as well. So we have a mobile planetarium that goes in, opens up and then it closes down the next day. Um, and this is our planetarium, which is, I think, awesome. We have a huge screen, we have um, laser shows that we can do. Um, this is the, the console from which everything is steered. But the coolest thing, I think, is that we actually make our own films. Uh, so if you want to tell a story, we create it. And this year we created a story called Hello Earth, about communication in space. And apart from that, we have laboratories where we can come in and conduct experiments. Um, there is a science picnic, which is still going, and we are still organizing it. Um, and we have a festival, like the one, the Copernicus I mentioned earlier in Krakow, talks about the sort of the humanist approach to science. We have a festival that kind of goes forward. We try to identify areas of science we think will be kind of blowing up in the next couple of years, or already becoming very important right now, and talk about them. So last year we asked the question, who does space belong to? And we had discussions about whether we should introduce a law in Poland allowing us to mine asteroids. And I think as a result, next year, there is a company moving to Luxembourg to start mining asteroids in future. And this year we talk, so this was last year, um, this year we're going to talk about algorithms and it's happening literally today. Uh, today the festival started. Um, so I'll be going there on, in the weekend. And we have summer in, in the park where we have meetings with scientists and etc. 
And finally, because we think there is no science without communicating it in a visual form or musical form, etc., we have um, other scientific and artistic events. One is Paths to Life, where we have a long series of seminars with top experts around the world to talk about biology, for example, this year, sometimes astronomy and others. Um, we have FameLab, the competition I mentioned earlier, where we bring in scientists to give them a chance to um, learn how to communicate science. And just to finish, um, I know many of you have been asking me over the past, how do we actually get money to do all that stuff? Because it, it looks um, quite expensive, right? <laughs> so uh, we have 300 staff, full-time staff, as I mentioned, so we have to provide for them. And we have all these amazing events in the building, etc., etc. So we are supported by three organizers, um, the Ministry of Science and Higher Education, the Ministry of Education, and the City of Warsaw. All three of them provide about slightly less than a half of our budget. So this is an annual contribution they make. They cannot stop making it. They sign the contract and for the next couple of years they have to give us that amount of money every year. The overall budget of Copernicus is approximately 50 million, is what is. So they give slightly less than a half of that. And then we have sponsors like Samsung and Energy, Polcomtel, Bass, Raytheon, Roche, National Center for Research Development, lots of big companies, international companies, smaller companies, etc. Uh, but we also have our own conference center. We use it for our own stuff. So you can see there were 59 program events, so our events in our conference center just last year. But there were over 90 commercial events. And this provides quite a lot of funding for us as well. And next year, we are beginning to build something called the Copernican, Copernican Revolution Lab. So right next to Copernicus Science Center, there will be a second building, which will be a 100% R&D center, to learn how to communicate science best and how to educate best. Um, that's something very close to my heart because I'm in Copernicus, I'm the head of education lab. So all our education lab, 20-something uh, people, will be moving into this new building, which we are opening in 2020. And the whole idea is here to bring together scientists who research education and science communication, not just from Poland, from all around Europe and around the world to bring in um, sort of practical, uh, practical practitioners, so the teachers, the education professionals, the science communication professionals, people that actually implement these ideas that researchers come up with. But from the third side, to bring in uh, businesses as well, because we figure that some of the best way of scaling things that we do are through commercial ventures. And we want to create a center where all these three can basically mix together and work on projects together. And we already have projects like that going on for a couple of years now. We will be just scaling our activities. And so this is another building, which is going to cost us <laughs> many, many millions. And we already secured funding. And we begin building, as I said, next year. Opening is in 2020. So when you're visiting Copernicus in 2021, most likely you will already be able to visit both Copernicus and the R&D Center because it will have an open space where you can always go visit and experiment with some of the things we're developing there. So, I'll finish here. Sorry, it was a lot to cover. Um, I'm, but if you have any questions, come and talk to me. Thank you. Three questions. <laughs> yeah? Um, you talked about... Uh, you have talked about uh, brain drain in Poland. Is it uh, replaced partly by Ukrainian? Do you feel like you have uh, some Ukrainians, uh, I mean, not association, but maybe community or something? So, yeah, we have um, lots of um, you guys moving to Poland, which I find to be a, an awesome thing. Um, and I think most Polish people agree. Um, I have to say, currently, if you ask, was the mood, national mood, people are against immigrants, but for some reason, Ukrainians are not counted as immigrants. It's kind of like, no, you guys like us. And uh, because of the, I was telling some of you guys earlier, I think because of the, the orange protests you had before, because of the Maidan, because of, of your troubled relationship with Russia, uh, we welcome you with open arms, saying like, if you don't like them, you're our friends. <laughs> No, just joking, but I think um, generally lots of Ukrainian people move to Poland and I think we're at a stage where our industry is developing so quickly we need a lot of people to actually join our companies and we're very happy to have Ukrainians move to Poland to do that. Um, we have um, many people that I work with in the space sector in Poland as well have moved from Ukraine, uh, learned Polish very quickly. I'm always amazed by how quickly you guys learn Polish. And then after just two or three years, 
it is really hard for me to distinguish if I'm talking to a Polish person or to a Ukrainian person, or whether the, a person in transition, or whether there's a person who has some Polish roots or some Ukrainian roots. It's very difficult to tell. So basically, it, it, I think we kind of mix so well, um, it, it just kind of works. I don't think there is like, a, I'm not sure at least, if there are separate like NGOs that group together Ukrainian people in Poland. Maybe there are, I'm, I don't have access to those. Um, but it could be potentially an interesting idea. But I think I like more the fact that everybody seems to be currently integrating so well together. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. I watched with such a big envy. And uh, my question is, um, I watched in your, your web page of the Vestniki Nauki, something like this. That, Nauki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, the most of the people are young people. And in Ukraine, we have a problem that there are not so many young people stay mm. in the science. Mm. Because there's a financial problem, uh, government mm. problems. And what do you can... Like, what advices can you give us to like proceed like you are, like, like you did? So I think, like, um, for you, first of all, many of the, the spokesmen and spokeswomen of science that, that you could see are actually not in Poland. Uh, many of them live abroad. And if there is an event in Poland, if you need to write an article about um, science in Poland, etc., they just do it remotely or they come and, and join here. So um, we are very much in favor of brains circulating. So many of these people joined in Poland and then went abroad or were abroad and came back to Poland while they were spokespeople of science. So I, I quite like the fact that they kind of move around. Now, when it comes to lack of people in Ukraine or lack of young people in, in Poland doing, for example, PhDs or science, etc., that is a... I mean, it's a very multifaceted problem, and I'm I'm very happy now changing hats from the spokespeople of science into the Polonium Foundation. We have a lot of research we've done in this area, and I have some recommendations I think I can make to you. Um, it very much depends on the climate in the country, the governmental funding, the, the opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think we can talk about it later over coffee. If somebody else is happy to join, I would love to talk to you guys as well. Um, w there was a, a whole panel partially about it, right, before, and I kind of felt like, oh, maybe I have a question or a comment, but I, I hate being that person in the audience who says, I have a question, but it's actually a comment uh, that you hear so often on science conferences. Um, so maybe let's talk about it uh, a bit later, because I think this is a, a huge, huge problem and a huge topic. Hi, my question is, uh, what, what, uh, what do you tell that we need to start with in care? If we want to, you know, you started with some of these were picnics, we have science picnics, not only in Kiev, but around like in biggest cities in Ukraine. What do you, what would be the next step we need to do to achieve something like this? And also after you answer the question, please tell a joke, I think everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have to say, um, um, many of you guys know how startups work, right? We're in a very special place when it comes to startups entrepreneurship, innovation, etc. Um, you know, innovation mostly fails. Um, I mean, you create something new, something you think is innovative, and you put it out there, and it doesn't work. And then you try again, and it doesn't work. And you try again, and it doesn't work. And you try again, and it doesn't work. So my advice is keep trying with small things, and then some of them will grow. You can start, I think the, the wrong thing to go about these things is something to start with this bombastic strategy. There's somebody coming with the, this is a 20 year plan for how we're going to achieve this or that. And then you start implementing it and spend millions on it, etc. And then halfway through you figure out it doesn't quite work, but I already invested millions in it. What's going to happen later? Recently I had a conversation with the, somebody from the Irish, Irish government. They are planning to spend 34 million euros over the next couple of years to increase participation of women in science in Ireland by four percentage points. And they asked us uh, in Poland, what's, what's, uh, you know, what's your attitude towards it? What's your experiences? And I looked at the data and I was like, well, we had an increase of 14 percentage points, so 10 more than you guys, and we didn't spend anything. So it was the change of culture, a shift in culture, a fact that there were NGOs working, many other aspects. So if we were to spend 34 million on achieving that, potentially we could get the 4% in, increase, maybe 14, maybe 18 percentage points increase. I don't know. But the question is sometimes that when you start with these massive projects, you are not ever sure whether you're actually having the impact you are hoping to have. So my advice would be, 
Start with something small, see how it works. If it works well, you know, scale it a little bit, see how that works, whether you can keep up with the demand, if there is a demand. Scale it even further and further and further. I think the, the success of Copernicus comes from exactly this approach, that you know, it was a tent, and then five tents, and then 20 tents. And when you have 20 tents, you start needing an office, and then you have an office. Then after the, the first office, we actually needed to move to a bigger office. So we built like a, literally, it was like a metal garage that people got inside. It was cold inside, the walls were shaking, and there was no space inside. And we started building the building and we moved into the building. The building I showed you, most of the people do not work there. There's not enough space. We rented um, space in another building next doors. We started running out of space, so we're building another building now. Yeah, but it's just kind of like taking the steps that you grow a little bit and then make sure that what you have is sustainable and works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, expect that many of these things will fail. I, in my life, I started 12 associations <laughs> and one foundation, and only two of these things work. So most of them failed. I think we had time only for three questions. Uh, just a very okay. tiny yeah. one. I just wanted to add that actually picnics that we had now, the first one was supported by the Copernicus Center. And I remember it was in Kharkiv and there was a table from Copernicus Center and it was really good. I mean, it helped a lot. And I have a tiny question. Mm. What happened uh, to robotic theater? I remember you had it, but now I couldn't find it. But I was like, when I was second time in the Copernicus Center, it wasn't there. Uh, we closed it recently because we were buying new robots. <laughs> We already have new robots, so I was showing you the, the theater of high voltage. We now have, we also have a theater, a robotic theater, where robots play out like normal theater plays, but, uh, or books, etc. But uh, we had to close it down because some of the robots started breaking down after being used permanently every day for eight, eight years. So we bought new robots and we're installing them now. So when you come next time, I think they will, they will be already open. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, guys, again. And... Uh, any other questions, please come and talk to me. I haven't even touched the topic of education, which is what I am head of, and I have a whole another presentation on that, but I didn't decided to talk mostly about science communication to the external public. But thank you so much and for being such an attentive audience. <laughs>